tell me a brief summary of your exposure to this material, backing up as far as you need to go. I know you spent time in Iraq. Um, you went to Babylon. Maybe back up just prior to that. How did you get interested in the Anunnaki before you landed as a soldier? And I think you were Sergeant First Class or Staff yeah. at the time. Yeah, Sergeant First okay. Class. Yeah, so that's a pretty that's a pretty high enlisted rank too. So uh, you're leading people at that at that level in your career if you're if you're a sergeant first class. That's so, true. What, That's so what you were looking at and what you were able to talk about might have been two very different things. So so back up just a little bit. And tell me how you got started on the idea of even the Anunnaki at all before you got to uh, Iraq. When did that start? I, yeah, absolutely. It started perhaps probably when I was. Uh, eight or ten years old, being told in Sunday school the story about Noah's Ark. That was probably 1975, 1976, and I had just come back from watching the King Kong remake movie, and I saw this big gorilla in this oil tanker, and I thought, wow, okay, Noah's Ark, two of everything in the boat, and then there's the biggest ship right there. It's a steel ship. Uh, Noah had a wood sh wooden ship. So there's no way, I knew at 10 years old, there's no way that the Noah's Ark story was, was true as it was told. There had to be something else in it. There had to be some other reasons or some, you know, explanations as to, 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 to validate that he put two of everything in an ark. So, so <laughs> I was pondering that question for many, many years. And it never, it, did it occur to you that maybe geographically that not two of everything existed in that region? And how would you go out all over the world and get every two of every kind? I mean, that's that in well, and of itself is well, like. I knew, that, I knew that he couldn't get yeah. probably two raccoons where I was living at in New Hampshire. They were everywhere, but that was in the Middle East. <laughs> I had the same kind of thoughts when I was young. Isn't that funny? So you saw, this, well, you know, it brings up an interesting question. Um, and we'll get to this, but uh, according to Moral Bellino, every Hebrew text was borrowed from the Sumerian documents, and they all know this at the very highest levels of the Vatican, okay? They just failed to tell the Protestants and the Christians and everybody that came after them that, uh, by the way, this was a story that was borrowed and changed significantly. So, so in that changing significantly, especially in the Hebrew to uh, Torah, which are the first five books of the Bible or the Old Testament, right? Is it possible that they made all these mistakes like the plurality in Genesis 126, the ludicrous story about Noah's Ark, without introducing the idea that maybe there was some genetic sampling going on? Do you think they told these anomalies intentionally for people later to realize they were forced to take a version of the truth and plagiarize it for their own uh, particular aims. Oh, absolutely. I, I do think that, Daryl. Um, I've always been perplexed, as I said, the Noah's Ark story, and I knew that uh, from reading the first five books in Genesis, that that was a extrapolation from information that is much, much, much older. I mean, you look at the story of Moses. I mean, that's a retelling, the story of Jesus. But when did, you, when did you realize it was a retelling? That's what I'm fishing for here. How did you get onto that? The first time I think I realized it was a retelling of the story was probably the earliest time when I was really cognizant of that was probably 1998. So it was a long, it was just actually recently relative to when you were learning about these Bible stories, right? It took you a long time to go, wait, this may not be the absolute word of God the way I was taught, and probably you were in the part of the country you were in. Well, um, I was raised Southern Baptist. Was you were told Mormon, this. so it's... Oh, it's you were great. Mormon. You were right. raised Mormon? Correct. I was born and raised LDS, so... Okay, well, talk a little bit about that and how that conditioned you relative to <laughs> seeing this as another story. Because I know what the Southern Baptist perspective would be. I'm not sure what yours was. Well, um, the Mormons believe in some pretty wild stuff. I mean, I was born up and raised to believe that, I mean, I mean, anybody can just go, and I'm not going to teach Mormonism here, but anybody can go and read the doctrine, read the scriptures, read the Mormon stuff, and come up with a fantastic story. I mean, straight out of L. Ron Hubbard type of material. Um, you know, gold is prevalent throughout all of the Book of Mormon and the Mormon scriptures. Gold is the most fundamental thing that they loved, worshipped, and it was used as a tool or as a conveying intermediary of, uh, of information. One story particularly, when I was probably 10 or 12, that stuck in my mind, and then it was reiterated when I was a missionary down in the West Indies, 
uh, from 1985 to 1987 with the Mormon Church was there's a there's a story in the Book of Mormon about a small ball of curious workmanship worksmanship about the size of between my hands and this thing was a computer it was a compass it was a it was a uh, 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 a GPS device and I've always thought that this was had to be a GPS device because it was in front of these guys tent and it led them out of of, uh, of the Middle East right before King Nebuchadnezzar came in and took over. Mm. And they, they apparently sailed across the oceans, built a boat, you know, sailed across the oceans, and they landed in America, Central America. And the most thing that blows my mind is because all of the stuff I've read about from Zachariah Sitchin, I've read every single one of his books. I've got them here on display, you know, read every one of his books. And the main people in the, in the Anunnaki, the Anunnaki, but they're called the Nephilim, there's a character, multiple characters, like in the Mormon scriptures, called the Nephites. They're N-E-P-H-I, which I think is a play of words, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the Nephilim, and then they're the Nephites. I mean, if you read the Book of Mormon, I've read it multiple times and look for specific things. Like I look for military aspects. I look for uh, command and control, uh, you know, your serpent, you know, government control, things like that. Read it each time for one particular avenue or another. And it's the book. The book is bizarre. I mean, it's it's all over the map. It's crazy, but it's it, there's some validity there. Okay, and I'm not trying to prove LDS teachings to anybody because that's that's an individual thing. My goal and objective here is to try to understand it because I presented this stuff. I presented this material to the wow. temple president in Seoul, Korea. I said, look, what is the deal with this stuff? He happened to be an archaeology professor from BYU on loan for his temple duties for three years, he told me, he said, flat out, we cannot talk about this material, this stuff, we can't talk about it in the church. And I'm mm. presenting him this, I'm talking about this guy named Marduk. I wanted to talk to him about it. I said, look, Marduk, the, the pyramids, I, I mean, if I remember correctly, Wars of Gods and Men, wasn't he in prison there or something like that? But yeah. I have, multiple, I have yeah. multiple stuff in my head that I just wanted to come out in the... The, 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 the vehicle, I think, that I can bring it out in is a lot of the Mormon teachings that I can say, okay, teaching A is this, and then I can dovetail in some of the uh, uh, Anunnaki teachings from Sitchin and even from yourself. Because well, I was going to ask you uh, two things. You mentioned uh, these beings that left with a ball of some sort, some sort of GPS device, that they went to the Central America. Do you remember when you thought that happened approximately the same time columbus or is it pre-columbian no no the, the according to the mormon scriptures according to the you know the theology and the stories of this it happened about 600 bce okay um, now there was an earlier um transfer of many people from the middle east about 2500 bce and the book of mormon talks about that in just a very brief detail those fellows were called the Jaredites. Jaredites, okay. I don't know, but I know that there's so much repetition. There's so much Anunnaki alien stuff that's imbued in the Mormon church. I mean, I, I really firmly think that Enlil is in charge of it. I mean, I go to the temple over there, and I, the, the spirit on the grounds is like, okay, if Enlil was doing this, that's him. And yeah, for, well, give, give me another couple names. Enlil, Enki... You see any evidence of any Enkiites, or is it all Enlilites in your mind? I think it's all mixed. I think there's a lot of overlap. I think these guys play multiple roles, but I think probably we've got an 80% solution with Enlilites, an 80% solution with Enkiites, but there's a lot of overlap. There's cousins going back and forth. And yeah. these guys live forever relative to us. Right. And in the Mormon teachings, Gerald, there's a... A, a mathematical doctrine in the Doctrine and Covenants that talks about the time of God, the reckoning of the Lord. And it's the, and I did the math on it. I, did, I must defer to you because you're probably a lot smarter than me on these type of equations. But I did the rudimentary math, and it's the same as the sexagesimal system. Okay? And it, and it made me think, I think, oh, my God, this stuff is totally alien stuff. So I kept reading Mormon stuff to some degree. But I kept accelerating my, my Zechariah Sitchin research, knifing through it, mm. just 
if I didn't understand it, I just kept going and going and reading it again, going to a seminar. I went to one seminar, a Sitchin seminar up in Dallas, Fort Worth in 2002, brought all my books. He signed every one of them, met him, very humble guy, his wife. Mm -hmm. It was a great meeting. Yeah, I was going to ask you, I've always been curious about a couple of things about Mormonism. Two things. Number one, uh, there was a Mormon temple very close to my house in San Diego, right on the Interstate 5. You know, it was, looked like a spaceship. <laughs> it was an amazing building. And they built it new while I was there, so yeah. I watched the whole thing go up. Well, of course, they put this golden-colored angel with a trumpet facing to the east, and I asked, well, what is that? And found out it was the angel Moroni. And when I looked into that a little bit farther, it seemed like there was a connection between Moroni and Quetzalcoatl. And I was like, I need to ask somebody about this. It's been kind of a background research topic for me. What is your take on that? What is this symbolism of this particular angel? And is, do you see a connection between Mormonism and what happened in Mesoamerica in particular? I'm really focused on that. Especially well, I, Quetzalcoatl. I, I am too. I'm currently rereading... Um, the uh, uh, the realms of uh, what's it called? The fourth book that Sitchin wrote, the Lost Realm. The Lost Realms. I'm reading it. I'm, yeah, I'm stuck on one guy. I'm going to answer your question. I'm stuck on one guy, one researcher who I think has a lot of answers. He's long dead. Yeah, that's uh, it right there. Fernando Montesinos. That that guy's got some information, but we don't know where it is. Um, yeah. It's locked up, I think, the Vatican because he was a monk and. Uh, but anyways, but and didn't uh, BYU sponsor some archaeological explorations either at Giza or one of the temples of the sun? I want to say it was at Palenque or Chi or uh, Teotihuacan. I can't remember. I do believe they did. I know that they're very active in searching in South and Central America for for evidences to support the validity of the Book of Mormon? Well, this is, this is why I'm asking, is because it looked like their focus was in Central and South America, and, and this is where I found this connection between the angel Moroni and Quetzalcoatl, and somehow, you know, it was the idea of a, a golden tablet, right, for Joseph Smith, whereas yeah. there was uh, writings in the uh, Emerald Tablets by Doriol that said that he was given the task to retrieve the Emerald Tablets, from the Temple of the Sun, and he didn't ex exactly say whether it was the one like at Cusco in Peru or the big Temple of the Sun at Teotihuacan. And now that we're finding all these underground chambers and all these artifacts at Teotihuacan, a lot of us are believing that's where it was. And this was in 1925 when that happened, and then it was decoded. So the other date that I was trying to look for to see if the Mormons were involved in Central America was uh, whether they somehow had a relationship with Enoch or the long count of the Maya. If you, if you were, do you have any idea about that? I don't know that, but um, in the Pearl of Great Price, which is a Mormon piece of literature, Mormon uh, scripture, they talk about Enoch um, being taken up into heaven. Oh, and really? Oh, yeah. Enoch himself, <laughs> Joseph Smith himself was given apparent revelations to show this kind of stuff in the, the highest degree of glory, the heavens. It, there's gold everywhere. I mean, he even said, he said he witnessed the, the throes of the celestial kingdom and the streets are paved with gold. So gold is repeated throughout everything in the ancient scriptures, Sitchin stuff, and even in the modern stuff. I mean, more than yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, can, well, check this out. Consider the uh, invasion of Mexico and Peru specifically to get gold in 1519 by Cortez. And I think um, it was even, I think it was a bit earlier for Pizarro in Peru. I have to look. No, no, it was after him. It came after him. He saw what Cortez did, then did the same thing about 11 years later, okay? So from 15 to, uh, 19 to 1521, Cortez showed up in Veracruz, Mexico, looking for gold. And he met the uh, representatives of the Maya and the king, Montezuma, and these people actually gave uh, Cortez, who had sailed from Cuba, on exactly the one read year, which happened every 52 years in the Mayan calendar. So they thought he was Quetzalcoatl coming from the sea, right? Here they are giving him the outfit and the gold and all this stuff, thinking it was him returning because he said he'd come back every one read year. 
Yeah, isn't 52 a uh, boss number also? Well, that's a good point. So we know the angle of the Giza pyramid was 52 degrees. degrees. And if you look into the calendar that he introduced, 52 was a, a very important number because it related to the number of weeks in the year. If you used um, four cycles of seven days each in the lunar calendar, which is where he ended up with a, a, a squabble, if you will, with Marduk in Egypt, uh, what caused him to leave in the first place. You know, Marduk in the, in the Wars of Gods and Men, as you mentioned, he ended up trying to assert himself 24 years too early to take over the Anunnaki Council, Lord of the Earth. That's what he wanted, right? You remember yeah. that circa 2000 BC. Well, he, because he did that, he got sent into exile and he was entombed in the Giza complex where he was supposed to die. And that's where Ninma showed up, ran intercession, and uh, he was released from there because of her. But later on, Ninurta actually uh, took over the Giza complex and took the crystals out and all this kind of stuff. Well, through all these wars and problems that were going on in Egypt, about 3,113 BCE, this is when the Mayan long count started in Mesoamerica with the Olmecs, exactly August 13th for that matter. Well, that long count, was very important for the Zulkan calendar, as was the 52 and the 20 count and the 13 and the 9 in the, in the other calendars that they were using. So these numbers were real important. So the idea that 52 was so important to Quetzalcoatl and it was Thoth's number, you know, this is how Sitchin and several of us other researchers in the Lost Realm put two and two together that this same entity that was teaching calendar language in Mesopotamia and his number was 52, and in Jija, it was the same one that ended up in Mesoamerica. So, uh, so that's kind of okay. you. So we're actually talking about that in one of our episodes for the Anunnaki series <laughs> that, that's coming Well, up. there's so much overlay. I mean, there's so much overlay, but going back to your first question way back when, how I came into this stuff, as I said, I was into the Mormon stuff. A lot of the Mormon things, doctrines, seemed very alien in nature by virtue of the devices that the Book of Mormon talks about, the, the, it's called a Leohana, that's what the device is, the GPS computer type thing. Joseph Smith found these golden plates with all the records of the Mesoamerican people that were living here for about 25, 2800 years, and it was buried in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. And then he came across them in 1823 or 1824, translated it in, into the book, what is now known as the Book of Mormon. And if someone, I mean, it just read it, it's just so bizarre. There's so much stuff all over the map. Uh, do, you, do you recall what the language was originally written in that he had to translate it into? He said it was Reformed Egyptian, which I don't know what that means. That could be just a, hey, I don't know what it is. I'm just going to call it something to appease a potential well, scholars. They, probably, they may not have known what to call the Mayan codices by that time because they had glyphs that looked very much like the hieroglyphs from Egypt. Yeah, so, you're very right. That could be very true, and I'd bet anything it's, there's some validity in that point. But, but, but the reality is, could we actually decode it then? Because uh, we didn't see the Mayan codices decoded until they found the uh, sarcophagus stone at Palenque. And this was with uh, David Stewart and uh, Tatiana Poroshevich, these folks. And this was in the 70s, okay? So, so how did he decode this stuff? If it was, you know, way back then, I don't know. I have no idea. Well, he, he apparently used uh, a Urim and Thummim, uh, divining rods, and uh, seer stones to decode, to translate this Book of Mormon. And I've read it, and just one time I read it, and I was looking for, okay, how can this guy put this book together? I mean, it's an insane book. There's stuff all over the map. It's not well written. It's very, very bizarre, but there's a lot of truth. There's a lot of things in it that really make me go, wait a minute. There's got to be some connection here to the yeah. Adam stuff, okay? The, the Mormon stuff, the Nephilim stuff. But I can't, I'm either way ahead of people in, my, in the church and they don't want to, they, don't, they can't comprehend it. Or the guys up top have told me, hey, shut up. We can't talk about this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what it is. Only thing I can do is keep reading, keep thinking, meeting guys like you and Jay and talking about it. Yeah, well, I, I suspect if I had to go dig into this, and you may be the one to do this, 
people that got exposed to esoteric other cultural religions and things like that, they were generally either gypsies or they were connected to a secret society that was that was exposed to this. And I, and listen, I think the time frames you're mentioning, uh, I think the ma the Masonic order was very strong in America. It was uh, what 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 year are you talking? Seventeen eighty five. Um, well, Adam Weiss, Weishaupt, is that oh, his name? Wow. Well, Weishaupt was 1776. So that's when the Illuminati were formed in Bavaria that ended up probably infiltrating the Masons and vice versa. You know, the Masons are probably infiltrating them too. So, but uh, the idea of, uh, I, I think it was 1785, something like that, if I remember with Joseph uh, Smith. No, no, Joseph Smith is 1820. Oh, 1820. Okay, well, still, we're in the time frame of the formation of the, of the new nation. Uh, so that's, that's possible. I don't know. There, I think if, if he was exposed to anything about Mesoamerican gods and Egyptian things, where else would he have gotten that stuff unless he was, A, an archaeologist, or B, or, or, or an anthropologist, or he was involved with a secret society? Well, there's a book written by a guy, I can't remember his name, it's called Early Mormonism and the Magic World View, written by a scholar, BYU professor, and he was kicked out of the Mormon church for writing that book. Well, that's the book you want to read then. <laughs> uh, I did read it. I, I own it, and I've read it, dove, dove into it extensively. That was a big inspiration for me for a lot of my thoughts and the direction I'm going in. Uh, his name's D. Michael Quinn. That's his name, D. Michael, D. Michael Quinn. Quinn. Okay, correct. And um, you know, he 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 explored the early 19th century America, uh, the time at Smith where Smith was living. There was a lot of religious revivalism. There was a lot of hey, join my faith. Hey, join this faith. You know, so there was a lot of competition. Remember, the the only the only media they had was newspaper, and that was very probably sporadic and only in some of the some of the urban centers, centers uh, of America then at the time. So, I mean, for Smith to see a vision, four times in one night it was repeated exactly, and he said it in his own journal. He said the vision occurred four times. Moroni, the guy on top of the temple, blowing the trumpet to the east, a golden statue, nine feet tall, blowing the trumpet to the east, Moroni came to him four times in one night, repeated the same thing over and over again verbatim, which told me, that is probably a holographic projection, maybe from a repeater satellite in orbit somewhere, somewhere out uh, in space. Yeah. The Mormon planet where they believe, where, where Mormon, faithful Mormons believe that God resides. I say God with a capital G, where the God of all resides is a planet. They, call it, they believe it's a planet called Kola. Now, if you go into the Battlestar Galactica, uh, models and in, in, in the lore of TV, even the old show and the new show, Battlestar Galactica, Glenn Larson was a Mormon. He wrote the scripts for that stuff, and he changed the name. He just did a little bit of reverse action. He changed the name of Col Col uh, Cola to Cobal. So the planet where the god lives is Cobal. So I was always wondering, is this possibly the planet called Nibiru or, or Planet X? So I've always been looking for this correlation to, to s support each other. Right. So in general, you're looking at the connections from what you learned about Sumerian history and their gods, the Anunnaki, to a connection in uh, the Mormon religion. In general, that's what you're doing. That's exactly it. Okay. And the, the information that I have, or the information anybody has, pertaining to the, the planet that God lives on, Mormons aren't going to just talk about this stuff because they're going to want to know who you are, why you're asking these kind of questions. Yeah. Even most Mormons in church are not going to always talk about it because it's, you know, it's pretty deep, heavy stuff. But right. that's what I've always been gravitated to. I want to know the real meat and potatoes of something because I can understand it. I don't mm -hmm. know why. I can just get it. I, I think, um, I, I, just off the cuff, uh, based on the questions you're asking, I think if you were to have read my books, um, you would be a little clearer on some of the labels that they use. For instance, uh, Big G... OD that I use has nothing to do with a being living on a planet because when the seventh planet Mercury rising Thoth goes very deeply into who he believes the creator of all is and this universal consciousness or universal mind and it definitely is not 
uh, represented by an incarnation in a body or even localized through a planet. So that very well could have been Anu, like you're, like you're stating, if it was the planet Nibiru. Yeah. Um, again, there's, there's, the, more I, the more I learn, the more I have questions about. So I could amass all this information and then still not know anything. So it's... Well, you may just want to pick one of them, like, like the idea of what did Moroni tell Joseph Smith verbatim. So look, look at that a little bit more closely, and I could possibly do the same. I'm relying yeah. on you to do it since this is your passion. And the right. second thing is, focus on where BYU was doing their archaeological work. Where exactly were they looking? Because that's very telling about what they viewed as the source of the information that basically gave substance to their belief system. So, and I haven't done that, I have to be honest. So uh, I know that's your passion and that's where you're going. But that's, where I, that's what I would do. And, and, you know, there's probably lots of people who have written books about possibly this topic. I haven't searched for them. But I've always thought, you know, I found a, a basis for the Anunnaki in almost every civilization that's been started across the world and pretty much every religion, too. So, um, for instance, uh, and this one may be shocking to you, is uh, I have many, many references now that show that one of the Anunnaki was actually Jesus, and that was Thoth himself. So I believe that, Gerald. I really do. And now, that. listen, Thoth was a, also known as Quetzalcoatl in uh, Mesoamerica. So if the angel Moroni had some connection to Quetzalcoatl, I'm interested in finding that out, too, just so you know. Because the, because the connection for me is Enoch. <clears throat> listen, when, uh, when Noah was born in the book of Enoch, it was a very unusual birth. Now, whether they were storytelling, just to make it look fantastical, or it's real, they said the baby was born with blonde hair, blue eyes, had rosy, rosy colored skin, and levitated and spoke at birth. Freaked his father Lamech out so bad he went looking for some answers because he didn't know how to deal with us. This is the biblical account, right? And uh, so in that account, he started walking up the Adam to Noah hierarchy chain starting from his father, Methuselah, and then back up to his father, Enoch, okay, who, who actually was the son of none other than who? Cain and Abel. So Cain was, was the son of Enki and uh, we call her T.T. or Eve, <laughs> the first, you know, bipedal hominid that they experimented with. And Cain was the offspring of that. And, you know, the Cain and Abel story, Cain kills Abel, well, Cain turns out now he's half Anunnaki, if that's true. If his father was a, a full-blown Anunnaki and his mother was one of the primitive workers, well, so now, and Abel was born of the two primitive workers. So he, he had very little Anunnaki, kind of like we do, right? Yeah. And so this Cain was a supposedly banished to the land of Nod, east of Eden, and by none other than Yahweh. Well, that was Enlil, okay? <laughs> right, so, so you have yeah. to ask yourself, if Cain was banished east of Eden and all of a sudden uh, Lamech starts going up the hierarchy chain looking for Methuselah and he lands with Enoch. Well, Enoch was Cain's son who built a city for him while he was in exile. Well, guess where that was? Mesoamerica. Because that's where he went to find Enoch who was there with the gods, living with the gods, right? Well, which ones were they? <laughs> so so uh, in the Lost Realm, and I won't spoil the book for you, no, I've read it, The Lost Realm, yeah. Oh, well, one of the key connections you realize there was when Sitchin started taking apart the word uh, Tenochtitlan, which was the Aztec capital. Well, it contains the name of Enoch in there, who was Cain's son, right? So is that the city that Cain built for his son Enoch, who we now know as Thoth? It's the same being. So now it's like it's really thick, okay? <laughs> so. Oh, there's so much to there's so much to really grasp on it. I mean, multiple people across the world have little bits and pieces to contribute to common knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's why you know I found your stuff three or four months ago. I was outside doing some work, and I was like, "Holy shit, this is this is a guy that I can listen to." I mean, there's there's a lot of kooks out there, a lot of quacks. There's a lot of you know guys that think they know, but they don't. They don't have the depth, you know, the depth to really dive into it. Well, um, everybody needs a different level of uh, uh, oh yeah. substance in their diet. Hey, one thing that really comes, yeah, yeah, I wanted to ask you. So, 
So you somehow knew through your Mormon exposure about this crazy link to potentially other, uh, other extraterrestrial influences, okay? Let's put it that way. So now you end up in the military. I don't, well, know, what, I don't know what rank you were when you ended up in Iraq, but did you, have you, had you read Sitchin stuff before you landed in Iraq? Yes. I started reading Sitchin stuff in 1998. Okay. So when I went to Iraq, Iraq, and you were in Iraq, I, right, were in Iraq. by the time I by the time I had gone to Iraq, when I was in Iraq, I had already established a correspondence with Sitchin through the mail over many years since okay. 2000 or 2001. I started a correspondence with him, and he wrote me back, which was blew my mind. I was in Korea. He, he's, we were writing to each other, and he was very general, very nice, very short in his answers. Um, you know, he was glad that I'm one of his fans. And then I went to Iraq, and I wrote him a note, said, uh, "I'm going to Babylon, the ancient city of Babylon. I'm going to take tons of pictures. Would you like me to send them to you with a write-up?" And he wrote me back. He said, "Please do." Um, and then he wrote me back again after I sent him all the pictures and in a two or three page write up he wrote me back and he said can i please put this information on my website and i said yeah by all means go right ahead sitchin.com and he did i don't think it's there anymore because that was 2004. are these the uh are these the pictures that you uh, turned me on to on your facebook page or are they different no they're the same ones oh, oh yeah fantastic set of pictures and by the way thanks so much for sharing them with me because uh we included them in the first episode of the Anunnaki series, and I think they turned out really well. I think you saw that. Is that correct? They, uh, there were some in there, but I was expecting more because I, I, I had like 80 of them, but I may, maybe it was the second one. That's why well, we were focused on a couple of we were focused on a couple of topics. So hopefully we'll get to use more of them. Yeah, feel free. Okay. I'm on record. Use all the ones you want if you'd like to. Okay, terrific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, and we gave you uh, we gave you photo credit in there, too, because uh, I know that had to have been a very different experience being in Babylon, having read this stuff. I can't even imagine what must have been going through your head. Gerald, I was all alone. I was with one other guy because we had to go battle buddy stuff, right? We were walking around in those ruins. Unhindered, unfettered access, go and do anything we wanted to. Um, you know, digging around. I mean, there was these mounds of just debris former homes, former palaces, just nothing there anymore. And they look like they, they have never been dug into or had any research done into them, dug under them and turned up the earth because of all the wars. Mm -hmm. You know, the calamity of the nuclear winter that blew over there when, you know, outlined in the wars of gods and men. So, so of, all the, of all the temples, I know there was a Ninurta temple and a Ishtar Temple, were any of those still standing that you were able to go see? No, I wasn't, no. Able to determine, I wasn't able to decipher any of those. Now, we had a guide, an Iraqi guide that was, he gave us the very rudimentary tour mm -hmm. of the facility, but I knew more than this guy was talking about. I mean, that's, that's fine, that's okay. I was asking him questions and he didn't know, he did not know who Minerta was or, or, or uh, you know, of course, he knew who Marduk was because it's illustrated. Right, right, right. That, yeah. Yeah. But he didn't know some of the other details. So he says, oh, just go look around. So I went in there, looked around, dug around, spent the entire day out there. Now, it's, da it's a dangerous zone. I mean, we had to drive over there, and some of the Iraqi guys were telling – they were going like this. Yeah, yeah I can imagine. Oh, my, we're going to kill you guys. You know, we're going to get you all. Well, what, what, did you think of, what did you think about the military going in and occupying the palace? I mean, I saw that, and I was like, maybe it's symbolic, it's sending a message, but wow. We occupied all of the palaces over there. Yeah, I saw I that. How'd that make you feel? Um, I felt like I was raping part of a rape gang, actually. Um, it bothered me a lot that uh, we even went there. I didn't like going there in the first place. And, um, we don't need to be doing this crap going over there. And he said, okay, okay, noted, Sergeant. And I was like, okay got my orders, I'll go ahead and go. It's like that. I know. I, you, you and I are Army buddies that way. I spent seven years in the Army, and I actually was in Korea, too. I, where in Korea were you? I was in Seoul, right in Yongsan. Oh, really? I actually spent some time down at Yongsan at Hotel 201, because we, 
that's what we would fly in and out of going up to Chun Chon, which by the way, that camp page where I was is closed down now. It's not there anymore. Oh, things changed quickly. I mean, it's not that many soldiers there as there was 15, 20 years ago. Mm. Same thing in Germany. Um, but um, so tell I was me. by the Iraqi debacle. Going in there, it's like, we're doing uh, something wrong. We shouldn't have been doing that. Um, but I did do it. I drove all the way from Kuwait to Baghdad. And I wow, drove that's quite a drive. Uh, it took, have, about a, took about a day and a half. Did you have any interest in seeing any of the other sites, like Ur or uh, Nippur, Sapar, or Ridu, or Rook, any of those on the way up? Or was it too out of far out of the way? Um, I did have the interest in Desert Storm back in 91. I went to Ur with... Uh, a, a chief warrant officer. No kidding. But yeah, in 1991. But at the time, I had no appreciation for it. But he did. He did. He was a, a former Mormon bishop, and he was telling us about what this land was and this and that. And by this time, I mean the smoke fires of the oil wells were pretty pretty prevalent everywhere. Mm. So. Uh, I mean, I was 24, newly married. The only thing I was concerned with was getting out of there and staying alive. Yeah, yeah. You know, car when you get home, that kind of stuff. Sure. So I didn't really appreciate it. But but going up into Iraq again in 2000 and th or 2004, um, I would have liked to have done it, but I couldn't have broke convoy to go explore on my own. Um, that well, would. Well, while you were there, did you come across any interesting? experiences being told going this ziggurat get this going this museum take this out any of that kind of stuff that you had to be involved with or not no i wish i was because if i was told to go into those museums and and quote guard or uh loot you know i wouldn't have participated in that um they they need smart guys they need those those museums were looted and stuff was taken perhaps maybe some magical destiny things you know things for understanding this realm stuff mm -hmm. was, and i don't think it's re reappeared yet on the market well um, you realize in 91 uh, according to M dr michael salo in his uh, exopolitics paper he wrote uh saddam hussein who believed he was a reincarnation of nebuchadnezzar <laughs> right. uh, was down clearing the uh, very large engineering project down in a rook where he was draining the draining the river area and if there was any marsh or reed area he was trying to get that cleared out and uh they were doing this because they wanted to excavate uh gilgamesh's city and a lot of people believed he was looking for uh some sort of chamber some sort of portal that would allow him to reincarnate beings that uh, they didn't want him to do and that had a lot to do with the reason they invaded in 1991. So here he was doing this project while he's being invaded, and he was still going on while he's being invaded by the United States. I was like, wow, that's crazy. And he had a team of German magnetometers uh, operators come in and map out the whole underground area of a rook. They were looking for uh, Gilgamesh's grave, which, by the way, in 2003, the BBC came out and said later on, okay, because there was 91 with the incursion, and then what was it, 2003? It was another one. 2003 and then Desert Shield or whichever way they're other So all of a sudden, the BBC comes out. Hey, we found Gilgamesh's grave in the city of Uruk, right where, <laughs> right where uh, Saddam Hussein was over here digging. You know, so there were coincidences that really triggered me as well. Like, what what are they really there looking for? And whether it was cuneiform tablets, bodies for genetic studies, or um, or a portal of some sort, who knows? Or a spacecraft? God, who knows? You know, uh, they were very sophisticated, and we, we don't really know the full extent of it. Well, you got to remember, Gerald, I was perhaps probably the only soldier walking around that entire base camp that knew anything about what was the ground. How did that? <laughs> I bet you felt like an alien, didn't you? Well, I, totally, because, you I mean, I'm not talking to anybody about it either, could you? No, couldn't tell, couldn't tell a soul because I had probably 15 years – probably not so much, not, not 15 years, but a good eight, nine years of research under my belt at that time. So I couldn't tell anybody about that. I mean, I, the only person I could tell was Sitchin, and he was very interested. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, he was even in that situation. When he was at his, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't call it his prime, but probably in the late 80s, early 90s, 
You know, he met with uh, Dr. Harrington in 1990. Well, right in between that area. Yeah, the Naval Observatory, right? Yeah, in August of 1990. So about that time, he was being, he was out in the public with what he was talking about. But he wasn't, he wasn't like uh, a prolific lecturer where he was out, you know, touching flesh with a lot of people. He was a little more academic than that. And, and actually, he was very reserved because I think from a religious standpoint, he was very concerned about exposing his research and the backlash he would get from the world's religions you know <laughs> and, and you could see that in his behavior too and in his writings well he was a very Sitchin was a very humble man he was very quiet very very small voice very short sentences he didn't really give full answers well that's what i mean and, and you know take a person like that and put him on the lecture circuit and that's not their gig right and he no. was like that, i could tell yeah yeah. No, you need you need somebody that can speak better and captivate an audience. Sitchin didn't have that. Right. And that's and I think that's a large part. Not that that was bad. A lot of academics are like that. Uh, I even haven't done a bit of that. But but that because of that, I think was one of the reasons why um, he had to defend himself so much and uh, really got lambasted even when he died. Is that you know people just wanted to make him wrong. You know. Yeah, but when he was around to defend himself. It was he was an easy target. But the whole sitch in his wrong yeah. crowd is ridiculous. Because oh, I know. I don't even want to know there. Nothing. There's no counter offer. Sitchin has the material that by itself will stand the test of time. They offered nothing except saying he's wrong, and uh, and it was there was there, there was a it was a it was a it was a frivolous argument. I know. So, I actually I actually don't want to go there. It makes me quite upset when I hear dead heroes disparaged. I don't care if they were right or wrong. You know, it's, you, you have to ask yourself, okay, say they were 85% right. And by the way, in this order of reality, I don't think any of us ever get to even close to 100% truth in our life. You no. know, you'd be lucky to get, you know, 40, 30, 40, so I don't know, you know what the number is, five, <laughs> maybe so. Five, ten, but whatever it is you're getting, the idea of taking someone else and going, well, you, you might've made a mistake here, so you're completely wrong, that's, that's just throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and and it was done intentionally to make his stuff go away for the same reasons you experienced with your church. Okay, this was very uncomfortable stuff, and it starts affecting the the new world order and the powers that be control structure over the humans when you start dealing with politics or religion, right? Oh, we've oh we've got a a battle, a current battle right now today, as you know. Well, tell me about it. I don't I don't really stay in touch with U.S. politics because I I don't live there anymore. <laughs> I kind of peek in every once in a while, but I, I have so much disdain for people who think they're supposed to be governing other people in the first place. So tell no, me. No, I'm, I'm not speaking. I'm not speaking of Trump or Clinton. Oh, you're not. Okay, yeah, yeah. No, I'm speaking bigger. I'm speaking bigger, bigger terms than that. I mean, uh, the 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 new economic order called BRICS that Putin. Oh, ordered, sure, sure, yeah. That's a huge shot across the bow of every Navy aircraft carrier we have. Mm hmm. And it's an effective shot. Saddam Hussein took Iraq off of the dollar, the U.S. dollar, in 1999 or 2000 as a result of us putting sanctions on Iraq. He took us off the. He took his oil off the dollar. Did it happen before 1991 with the uh, with the invasion? Wasn't that related to him leaning toward the dinar? No, no. I'm talking about in 19 or excuse me, in, in the year 2000. About the year 2000, Saddam took his oil off of being traded with American dollars, which pissed off everybody in the West mm. because he could do it, everybody else could do it. So it created a huge problem for the West. The French were very happy because Saddam said, I will choose to trade my oil in euros, which only existed on a computer screen. It, doesn't, it, it, was, it was not real money. Right, 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 right. Well, the Europeans were very happy about that, and I think that was the real reason why we went into Iraq. And trust me, I was playing football with guys with sacks of $100 bills. I mean, this money was being flown into the country. There was no accountability. Well, there was some accountability, but there was really not much. You know, a stack of $10,000 bills is about this tall. That's about as tall as a stack of $10,000 bills, and that's, you know – gone you know so there was football being played with this money that was flown in there hundreds of billions of dollars of american currency 
to bring Iraq back up um, out of, or put it back into the dependency on the oil dollar. Mm -hmm. um, and I always thought that was the reason why we did go in. And then the, 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 the guys in Israel, they were probably hungry to get in there and raid the, uh, sure. the European, um, you know, and take stuff back that they wanted because they knew what they wanted. I mean, it was very well researched. They knew what they wanted when they got it. Hmm. Okay. Well, uh, I think uh, for our first interview, I think we got enough material.